I've had the great privilege, uh, secret privilege of reading the talk ahead of time, so I'm really excited to hear Freyoff tell it. <laughs> but um, uh, I would like to uh, bring up someone uh, much, much better than me to, to introduce Freyoff, someone who's known Freyoff for some time, and uh, that's uh, Michael Cornwall, who's been really involved in Gnosis Retreat Center and things like it for, for many years, a real, a real advocate and, and mover in this field. Uh, so uh, please, Michael Cornwall, come up. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Need a hand up here, I don't know. Old age. Well. Wow, this is this is wonderful, and Petra, your story is heartbreaking and moving, but also inspiring. And it's I think that's why the reason Nosos Retreat Center is going to happen. There's a lot of people who want it to. Fritschoff has been on board from day one, <coughs> and James and all the wonderful young people. So I just say. Uh, thank you for everyone here. There's an enormous, huge, unmet need for these kind of alternative services, this kind of heartfelt caring that um, being someone who worked in the public mental health system full time for 28 years, everyone goes to work there uh, to care and to serve, but the paradigm that Lang challenged and that we're challenging really uh, ends up with so many people not getting what they need. So the Nasus Retreat Center and the outreach program is about providing that really basic, simple, human-hearted connection with people. So let me start now to introduce Fritschoff. And um, let me say, I feel very happy and honored to introduce Dr. Fritschoff Capper tonight to this wonderful gathering in support of the NASOS pro project. Fritschoff has been a hero of mine for 40 years. And I'm sure Fritschoff's old friend, Artie Lang, would have loved to know that Fritschoff stepped forward to do this fundraising event so that a new Langian-oriented community of compassionate service would become available for people in extreme states in the Bay Area, a much needed community <coughs> that will be based on Lang's revolutionary social experiment of healing and compassion in London. Fritschoff is a true visionary, a visionary that for many decades has provided the kind of mana that simultaneously feeds the heart and soul and the mind all at the same time. Like Lang, Fritschoff also has fearlessly challenged the narrow and polarizing constraints of stifling traditions and conventionality while offering much needed revolutionary solutions to help free us from those dead ends. Many of us gratefully remember when his stunning and landmark book, The Tao of Physics, emerged on the scene in the 1970s. <laughs> I do, what a, what a gift that was for a lot of people. Bringing the good news that the hard science of physics could paradoxically be a possible gateway into a deeper understanding of our human spiritual birthright. The sacred ancient dance of numinous matter and energy that inspired his book had been directly experienced by Fritschoff during a profound and ecstatic unifying vision of science and spirituality, which happened spontaneously one day at the Oceanside in California. That healing vision powerfully transformed his life, and it can also touch us at the deepest levels of our knowing today. The Tao of Physics was followed by several equally groundbreaking, best-selling books over the decades, such as The Turning Point and Uncommon Wisdom, Conversations with Remarkable People, where Fritschoff tells of his interactions with R.D. Lang. And now the latest of Fritschoff's books, The System's View of Life, is available, as well as an amazing volume on Leonardo da Vinci. In the 1980s, I was enthralled listening to and watching Fritschoff and Lang together at a day-long gathering at the Palace of Fine Arts here in San Francisco. The spiraling energy and high-octane exchanges between the two friends was electric. 
unforgettable as they both boldly acknowledged the negative aspects of the social reality encircling us that day. It's really encircling us this day, isn't it, too? While at the same time pointing to liberating ways to affect positive change and broaden our horizons. Thank you, Fritchoff, for doing this fundraising event tonight and for your beloved presence at the yearly Artie Lang Legacy Gatherings at Esalen Institute that the Nassos Group and the wonderful leaders Michael Guy Thompson and Ida Gage make happen every year. Now for all of us here, I know it's going to be some more history in the making tonight, Fritchoff, as we receive your inspiring heartfelt wisdom, as we hear and are fed by your transformative message, your visionary words about the science of experience. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. All right, thank good you. evening everybody and thank you for these very kind and moving introductions. I think my talk had better be good now because with all this build up, <laughs> it's uh, quite something. Uh, those of you who know me will hear that I have a cold and I was originally, I called uh, James today and asked him whether he would read my talk. Uh, and I would just be here for questions, but it seems that my voice is okay, so I'll, I'm going to try and see how far I get. I have to sort of change my style of speaking a little. I, my voice carries usually, but that is a strain on the vocal cords, and so I've, I have to do a sort of a very soft uh, storytelling kind of, of thing. Uh, I'm, I'm really very happy to be here, and I think this is an ideal place for the event we are um, organizing because the very essence of these retreat centers that uh, are inspired by R.D. Lying, the very essence is community. Community is the healing ingredient. And I don't know, this space feels very much like a communal space. When I walked in here uh, tonight, it, I felt really good right away. And, and so I'm, I'm very happy to be here. So uh, we are talking about the legacy of the Scottish psychiatrist Ardy Lyon, arguably the most controversial psychoanalyst since Freud. Lyon's impassioned plea for a more humane treatment of those in society who are the most vulnerable established him firmly at the vanguard of an intellectual and cultural debate about the nature of sanity and madness, inspiring a generation of psychology students, intellectuals, and artists. Lang wore many hats during his career, psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, philosopher, social critic, author, jazz pianist, poet, shaman, he was all of those. And at the peak of his fame in the 1970s, he was the most widely read psychiatrist in the world. So in this talk, I would like to share some reminiscences of Adi Lang and his considerable influence on my life and my work. I met Lang in 1977 and I last, last saw him in 1988, a year before he died. During these 11 years, we met many times, either just the two of us or with our families and friends. We saw each other at conferences, gave joint seminars, and together participated in panel discussions. In these reminiscences tonight, I want to concentrate on my longest and most intensive encounter with Lang in September of 1980 at a conference about the psychotherapy of the future in Spain, sponsored by the European Association for Humanistic Psychology. <laughs> the central subject of our discussions at that conference was the nature of experience and the challenge of formulating a future science of experience. At that time, 
Lang's best known book was called The Politics and is called The Politics of Experience. And he was working on another book titled The Voice of Experience. I want to tell you how I experienced Lang's radical and often dramatic methods of inquiry. And I also want to share some of his prescient ideas which began to be realized by cognitive scientists a decade later. The conference in Spain took place near Zaragoza in a beautiful 12th century monastery which had been converted into a hotel. The array of participants was very impressive. In addition to lying, there were Stanislav Grof, Gene Houston, and Rollo May, and the group would have included Gregory Bateson. He had already committed, but unfortunately he died about two months before the conference started. During that entire week, I experienced a wonderful feeling of community and adventure created by the extraordinary group of participants and the magnificent setting of the conference. Lectures were held in the old refectory of the monastery, often by candlelight. There were seminars in the cloister and in the garden, and informal discussions on a large balcony until late at night. Lang was the animating spirit of the entire conference. Most of the discussions and happenings revolved around his ideas and the many facets of his personality. He had come to the conference with a large entourage of family, friends, former patients and disciples, including even a small film crew. If, if you wish, imagine something Fellinesque. You know, that, that's really what, what it was. Uh, and I should, I should interrupt here. Uh, when I really got jealous of lying was one evening during this, this week when uh, I asked him a question and I said, it's written in my book and my book is right on my night table in my room. I don't know why he didn't want to go up. Anyway, I went to his room, he told me where it was, and so I saw the book on the night table and next to the book was his diary, his calendar. And the following week there was a note, Rome, call Fellini. <laughs> so, so that's when I really thought he was in a different league. <laughs> so Lang was active day and night and never seemed to tire. He gave a series of lectures and seminars, spent many evenings in intensive discussions with small groups of people, and he would often end up at the piano long after midnight and reward those who had held out with superb renditions of Cole Porter and Gershwin. During that conference, I really got to know Lang. Up to then, our relationship had been cordial and our discussions very inspiring for me, but it was not until the Zaragoza conference that I really got close to him on a personal level. That's also when I began to call him Ronnie, following the uh, example of his friends. So on the day I arrived, Lang invited me after dinner to join him and a group of friends for a glass of cognac and discussions. We all sat down on this balcony, surrounded by the balmy breezes of a beautiful Mediterranean summer evening, Lang and I side by side, leaning against the white stucco wall of the balcony, with a fairly large circle of people in front of us. Lang asked me what I had been up to in the, last, in the past two years. I told him that I was working on a new book, The Turning Point, and that lately I had become interested in the nature of mind and consciousness. The next thing I knew, Lang was attacking me extremely vigorously. <laughs> How dare you, as a scientist, even ask about the nature of consciousness? consciousness he scowled indignantly. You have absolutely no right to ask that question, to even use words like consciousness or mystical experience. It is preposterous of you to dare mention science and Buddhism in the same breath. 
This was not a joking, teasing confrontation. It was the beginning of a serious, vigorous, and sustained attack on my position as a scientist, voiced passionately in an angry and accusing tone. I was shocked. I was not prepared at all for such an outburst. Lang was supposed to be on my side. Indeed, he had been. And I was especially taken aback by his attacking me like this on the day I had arrived and in front of a large group. At the same time, I felt his intellectual challenge, and my shock and confusion soon gave way to intense mental activity as I tried to understand Lang's position, evaluate it, and prepare myself for responding. In fact, as he continued his passionate diatribe against science, which he saw me as representing, I found myself becoming very excited. I've always enjoyed intellectual challenge, and this was the most dramatic challenge I had ever encountered. Lang had placed our dialogue in a spectacular setting. He was a master of organizing settings for discussions. <clears throat> so not only was I leaning against the wall of the balcony, facing Lang's tribe of friends and disciples, I also f felt pushed against the wall metaphorically by his relentless attack. But I did not mind. In my state of excitement, all traces of embarrassment and discomfort had disappeared. <coughs> the main point of Lang's attack was that science had no way of dealing with consciousness or with experience, values, ethics, or anything referring to quality. This situation derives from something that happened in European consciousness at the time of Galileo and Giordano Bruno. Lying began his argument. These two men epitomize two paradigms. Bruno, who was tortured and burned for saying that there were infinite worlds, and Galileo, who said that the scientific method was to study this world as if there were no consciousness and no living creatures in it. Galileo made the statement that only quantifiable phenomena were admitted to the domain of science. Galileo said, whatever cannot be measured and quantified is not scientific. And in post-Galilean science, this came to mean what cannot be quantified is not real. This has been the most profound corruption, Lang continued, from the Greek view of nature as physis, which is alive, always in transformation and not divorced from us. Galileo's program offered us a dead world. Out go sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. And along with them have since gone aesthetic and ethical sensibility, values, quality, soul, consciousness, spirit. Experience as such is cast out of the realm of scientific discourse. Hardly anything has changed our world more during the past 400 years than Galileo's audacious program. We had to destroy the world in theory before we could destroy it in practice. So you have to imagine this, this was a flow of words you know, without notes or preparation or anything. It just went on and on, and I wish I could imitate his Scottish accent. It was <laughs> even more powerful, you know, in this Scottish <laughs> brogue. But, uh, but, you know, listen to this, to his, uh, you know, culminating uh, punchline. We had to destroy the world in theory before we could destroy it in practice. It makes you shiver. Lang's critique was devastating. But as he paused and reached for his cognac, and before I could say anything in reply, he leaned over to me and whispered under his breath so that nobody could hear it. You don't mind me sending you up, setting you up like that, do you? <laughs> so, and he was, this was really masterful. Nobody heard it. It was really very close. He leaned over to me and whispered it in, in my ear. And with that aside, he instantly created a conspiratorial mood and shifted the whole context of his attack. 
It was just a dramatic shift with, with uh, it was just a dramatic shift with this uh, little aside. So I whispered back, no, I don't mind, and then I had to concentrate on my response. I defended myself as well as I could, being put on the spot with hardly any time for reflection. I said that I agreed with Lang's analysis of Galileo's role in the history of science, and uh, at the same time, I made a mental note to emphasize this more in my book, which I hadn't, but I, I did agree with him. I also agreed with him that there was no room for experience, values, and ethics in the science of today. However, I then went on to say that my own endeavor was precisely to help change today's science in such a way that these considerations could be incorporated into the scientific framework of the future. To do so, I emphasized, the first step had to be the shift from the mechanistic and fragmented approach of classical science to a holistic paradigm in which the main emphasis was to introduce context and meaning. Only when one had that holistic framework, I concluded, could one begin to take further steps in response to Lang's concerns. Well, Lang was not immediately satisfied with my response. He was sort of crouching, hanging in there, scowling still. He wanted a more radical approach, going beyond the intellect altogether. The universe was a vast machine yesterday, he said sarcastically. It is a hologram today. Who knows what intellectual rattle will be shaking tomorrow? And so the argument went back and forth for quite a while. And in the midst of it, Lang leaned over to me once more and said softly in a confidential tone, you realize the questions I'm asking you are all questions I'm asking myself. I'm not just attacking you or other scientists out there. I'm tarred with the same brush. I could not get so curled up over this if it were not a personal struggle. So again, he created this bond of uh, confidentiality, of, <clears throat> of uh, camaraderie and, and conspiracy. <laughs> <clears throat> so the discussion went on until very late that night. And when I finally went to bed, I still could not sleep for a long time. Lang had presented we, me with a tremendous challenge. I spent most of the next day pondering the problem and in the evening, I was ready to see him again. I've thought a lot about what you said last night, Ronnie, I told him at dinner. And I would like to respond to your critique in a more complete and systematic way tonight, if you feel like sitting down with me for another glass of cognac. Lang agreed, <clears throat> and so we settled down on the balcony again after dinner in the same setting as the night before. I would like to present to you tonight, I began, as completely and systematically as I can, the view of mind and consciousness that I see emerging from the conceptual framework that I'm now developing. This is not a framework in which your critique can be fully satisfied, but I believe, as I said last night, that it is a necessary first step toward that goal. <coughs> From the vantage point of my new framework, you can actually begin to see how experience, values, and consciousness might be incorporated into science in the future. Lyon simply nodded his head and kept listening attentively with intense concentration. I then proceeded to give him a concise summary of my ideas. I began with the view of living organisms as self-organizing systems, explained Prigogine's notion of dissipative structures, and emphasized especially the view of biological forms as being shaped by underlying processes. I then wove in Bateson's concept of mind as the dynamics of self-organization. At that time, I was not yet familiar with Maturana's more detailed concept of cognition as the process of life. Then I specified what I meant by consciousness, 
What I meant was the property of mind characterized by self-awareness. Awareness, I argued, is a property of mind at all levels of complexity. Self-awareness, as far as we know, manifests itself only in higher animals and fully unfolds in the human mind. And it is this property of mind that I mean by consciousness. Now, if we look at theories of consciousness, I continued, we can see that most of them are variations of two seemingly opposite views. One of these views I will call the Western scientific view. It considers matter as primary and consciousness as a property of complex material patterns, which emerges at a certain level of biological evolution. Most neuroscientists today subscribe to this view. So this was in 1980, but the situation still has not changed very much. This is still valid today. <coughs> I paused for a moment, and seeing that Lang had no intention of interjecting anything, I proceeded. The other view of consciousness may be called the mystical view, since it is generally held by in mystical traditions. It regards consciousness as the primary reality, as the essence of the universe, the ground of all being. And everything else, all forms of matter and all living beings, as manifestations of that pure consciousness. This mystical view of consciousness is based on the experience of reality in non-ordinary modes of awareness. And such mystical experience, they say, is indescribable. It is any experience, Lang shouted, interrupting me forcefully. And when he saw my puzzled look, he repeated, any experience, any experience of reality is indescribable. Just look around you for a moment and see, hear, smell, and feel where you are. I did as he told me, becoming fully aware of the mild summer night the white walls of the balcony against the outline of trees in the park, the sound of crickets, the half moon hanging in the sky, and the closeness attention of the crowd surrounding us, experiencing a symphony of shades, sounds, smells, and feelings while lying continued. Your consciousness can partake all that in one single moment, but you will never be able to describe the experience. It's not just mystical experience, it's any experience. I knew that Lang was right. Okay, Ronnie, any experience, I agreed. Now, since the mystical view of consciousness is based on direct experience, we should not expect science at its present stage to confirm or contradict it. Nevertheless, I feel that the system's view of mind seems to be perfectly consistent with both views and could therefore provide an ideal framework for unifying the two. Again, I, I paused briefly to collect my thoughts, and as lying remained silent, I went on to clinch my argument. The system's view agrees with the conventional scientific view that consciousness is a property of complex material patterns. To be precise, it is a property of living systems of a certain complexity. On the other hand, the biological structures of these living systems are manifestations of underlying processes. What processes? Well, the processes of self-organization, which we have identified as mental processes. In this sense, biological structures are manifestations of mind. Now, if we extend this way of thinking to the universe as a whole, it is not too far-fetched to assume that all its structures, from subatomic particles to galaxies and from bacteria to human beings, are manifestations of the universal dynamics of self-organization, in other words, of the cosmic mind. And this, more or less, is the mystical view. I realize I concluded that there are several gaps in this argument. Still, I feel that the system's view of life provides a meaningful framework for unifying the two opposing view of views of the age-old questions of the nature of life, mind, and consciousness. 
Now I fell silent. <laughs> My long monologue had been a tremendous effort for me. For the first time, I had laid out as clearly and concisely as I could my entire framework for approaching the questions of life, mind, and consciousness. I had presented it to the most knowledgeable and forceful critic and had been as inspired, spontaneous, and alert as I would ever be. So this was my answer to Lang's challenge of the previous evening. And after a while I asked him, how does that sound to you, Ronnie? What do you think of it? Lang lit a cigarette, took a sip of cognac, and those of you who knew him will know that he was into these rituals. It uh, took a long time for him to light a cigarette and to get an, uh, another sip of cognac and <laughs> to get, get ready. And finally, he made the most encouraging comment that I could have hoped for. I will have to think about it, he said simply. <laughs> This is not something I can address myself to right away. You have introduced quite a few new ideas, and I will have to think about them. <laughs> With this comment, the tension that had persisted for the last hour was broken, and we spent the rest of the evening in a very relaxed and warm conversation in which Ronnie and I were joined by many of our group. During the next two days, I spent most of my time with Lang and his friends in a relaxed and playful mood without ever mentioning our discussion. After a couple of days of relaxation and some more thinking, I invited Lang to join me for coffee after lunch. A true science of consciousness, I proposed, would have to be a new type of science dealing with qualities rather than quantities and being based on shared experience rather than verifiable measurements. The data of such a science would be patterns of experience that cannot be quantified or analyzed. On the other hand, the conceptual models interconnecting the data would have to be logically consistent, like all scientific models, and might even include quantitative elements. <coughs> such a new science would quantify its statements whenever this method is appropriate, but would also be able to deal with qualities and values based on human experience. I would add to this, Lang replied, that the new science, the new epistemology, has got to be predicated upon a change of heart, upon a complete turning around from the intent to dominate and control nature to the idea, for example, of Francis of Assisi, that the whole creation is our companion, if not our mother. That is part of your turning point. Only then can we address ourselves to alternative perceptions that will come into view. As I reflected on Lang's comment, several of our friends entered the cafe, and Lang asked me whether I minded if they joined us. Of course I did not mind and Ronnie invited them to sit down. Let me just tell these people what you and I have been talking about, he continued. If you don't mind, let me just reiterate what you have been saying. He then proceeded to give a brilliant summary of, my, of what I had said three nights before and during the last hour. He summarized the entire conceptual framework in his own words, in his highly idiosyncratic style, with all the intensity and passion that were characteristic of him. After this brilliant discourse, there was no more doubt in my mind that Lang had accepted my ideas. And of course, I was extremely happy. Now, <clears throat> the question of how experience might be approached within a, scientific, a new scientific framework, which had been the main subject of my discussions with Ronnie Lang, came into full focus in cognitive science a decade later. During the 1970s and 80s, the study of consciousness as lived experience was still taboo among most scientists. But during the 1990s, the situation changed dramatically. While cognitive science established itself as a broad interdisciplinary field of study, New non-invasive techniques for analyzing brain functions were developed, 
which made it possible to observe complex neural processes associated with mental imagery and other human experiences. And suddenly, the scientific study of consciousness became a respectable and lively field of research. <coughs> the central challenge of this research was, and still is, to explain the experience associated with cognitive events. Different states of conscious experience are sometimes called qualia by cognitive scientists because each state is characterized by a special qualitative feel, as lying emphasized in our discussions. The challenge of explaining these qualia is often called the hard problem of consciousness study an expression coined by the philosopher David Chalmers. In the mid-90s, biologist and neuroscientist Francisco Varela proposed a new approach to this heart problem that embraces both brain physiology and the analysis of first-person experience. <laughs> Varela called his new school of thought neurophenomenology. Phenomenology, as you may know, is an important branch of modern philosophy founded by the Austrian philosopher Edmund Husserl at the beginning of the 20th century and developed further by many European philosophers, including, including Martin Heidegger and Maurice Merleau-Ponty. The central concern of phenomenology is the disciplined examination of experience. And the hope of Husserl and his followers was and is that a true science of experience would eventually be established in partnership with the natural sciences. So neurophenomenology is an approach to the study of consciousness that combines phenomenology, that is the disciplined examination of conscious experience, with the analysis of corresponding neural patterns and processes. With this dual approach, neurophenomenologists explore various domains of experience and try to understand how they emerge from complex neural activities. In doing so, these cognitive scientists are indeed taking the first steps toward formulating a true science of experience. Prominent neurophenomenologists today include Walter Freeman, and Antonio Damasio. I don't know to what extent these scientists were influenced by Lang's views on the centrality of experience in human consciousness, which he published in 1982 in his book, The Voice of Experience. All I know is that my own attempts over the past 30 years to map out a science of qualities, integrating the biological, cognitive, social and ecological dimensions of life were triggered by my dramatic discussions with Ronnie Lang under the starry sky of Saragossa. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, Thank you so much. That was I enjoyed hearing that much more than I enjoyed reading it, though I enjoyed reading it a great deal. <laughs> um, so I think we we have a, a microphone maybe set up for for questions and can, answers. Can or we soon have to more be. light in the audience that we uh, can see each other? Is that I, I think that will that will soon happen. <coughs> but I, maybe in the meantime, I had just a couple qu questions. You, you know. Um, Shevik's going to set up this microphone. If you have questions, please line up here. I'll, I just have a couple questions while you do that. Um, you know, free off. I was I was curious. You know, you are you've been involved in the realm of of physics, and you've been involved in in the realm of I think philosophy surrounding science. You know, a great deal. And and um, of course, you knew R.D. Lang, but I'm. I'm curious. You, you've been involved in Gnosis Retreat Center for for how long now? No, no. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm I'm involved in a new project, mm -hmm. but I have not been to any of the traditional centers that.
people like Michael and others were in London. In right, I, right. You see, I I met Lang at the end of the 70s, and uh, you know I was doing my own thing. I was and I was not uh, into psychiatry. But not like Kingsley Hall or anything no, no, like that. No, no, no. But um, but now you're involved in Gnosis Retreat Center. I'm, well, what what brought you to 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 do that? Well, uh, you know, I'm. Uh, this this whole group of of you guys and and many who are not here tonight, um, and these people about forty people who meet regularly at SLN, uh, these are highly intellectual discussions uh, that uh, I wouldn't be part of otherwise. You know because I I don't move in these circles. I, I move in other circles of you know systems theory, ecology, you know physics, complexity theory. But uh, the nature of sanity and madness is not something I discuss with other people. So I'm fascinated by that, and there's also an emotional component. Uh, I think you guys who are preparing to live with people in these extreme states, and I have seen enough videos to know what this is like. You are just heroes, and, and I want to honor that and, and contribute in whatever way I can. So I, I feel this is a very, very special thing. Well, I, I do have one more question, but please, if you, if you have questions, feel free to line up here. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm very grateful for for Fritjof's involvement in the in the um, No Sister Retreat Center project. Um, I think uh, it it brings a whole new kind of of, of edge and a whole new kind of um, perspective. To, uh, other than what's there from the uh, purely psychological perspective, you know, it it brings this discussion of fringe experiences and altered experiences of reality into uh, a perspective that that allows us to um, examine the larger experience of reality through physics, and that's the that's that's the primary way we do. You that. know, I sh I should maybe add that uh, I I had some experiences experiences in the 60s that were similar because in the 60s we experimented with LSD and peyote and all that, and and we went through quite extreme altered states, and I I remember one uh, occasion which which will sound very familiar to you, which, which could happen in a, in the Gnosis Retreat Center. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my wife and I um, were living in Santa Cruz, and one evening, I don't know, we picked up this hippie girl, so she came to our door, I don't remember. She, she had overdosed on LSD, and was a really serious psychotic case. And uh, so we tried to help her, and there was a hotline and so we called the hotline for LSD overdose mm. and let her speak to this uh, woman who, who uh, ran the hotline. And it was a Christian hotline. And, <laughs> uh, and so the woman said, the woman said, well, I can, I can advise you, pray to Jesus and it will help you. <laughs> and you know what the girl said? What do you mean, pray to Jesus? I just saw him. <laughs> <laughs> So this is to tell you that I had experiences like this, and and actually I never thought about that. But you know, a whole two or three years in the late 70s and late 60s and early 70s, I went through a lot of these experiences with my friends, and so uh, a fascination of altered states arose at that time, and so I have this connection also. You know, I, I, I really relate to that. That's that's really what drew me to No Sister Retreat Center is 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 also this. Um, I mean, if you if you look at um, psychedelic experiences, um, my own psychedelic experience, or if you if you've ever been with someone on a psychedelic experience, you can, and and been with someone who is is been labeled psychotic or or something like that, you can you can definitely see that there's just too many common themes, you know, uh, between these things, and it's very meaningful. Yeah. Should we hear from um, Yes, please. 
Thank you guys, this is a very fascinating discussion. Um, I think I wanted to try to put it all together uh, in a more practical understanding because I have a lot of bits and pieces floating around. Um, and maybe you can correct me where I'm wrong because I think your theory is complex and hard to take in. Um, but from what I understand, you're saying that we are communal creatures that require community and this is even shown at a molecular level and it's sort of an undeniable thing that we are part of a system where we're, we need each other. Uh, is that is that yeah. what you're saying? Uh, let, let me first say that what I presented to you was historical, right? My arguments were, was this was the conversation I had with Lang in 1980. And so all these theories, including my own understanding, have advanced quite a bit since then. Mm -hmm. And so in my book, The Systems View of Life, I present a whole synthesis of my current understanding. But uh, I would disagree just with, with one point. The, uh, the need for community seems to arise when life emerges, not at the molecular level. But when life emerges with the first cell that evolved was actually a, a colony of bacteria, uh, these first living beings formed communities. And life has continued to form communities ever since. In fact, I often say that, that the way to create uh, a sustainable future is to create and nurture communities. That's what nature does. We know that, that no individual organism can live by itself. You know, <coughs> plants and animals, no, animals, I mean, animals, including humans, need the energy the plants provide with photosynthesis. The plants need the, the oxygen, need the nitrogen fixation at their roots by bacteria and other microorganisms. So there's always this uh, interdependence. And this is why uh, in the long story of evolution, those strategies for survival that worked were the strategies that involved communities. Okay. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and the second part of my question, for those of you who don't know, we also have regular salons every few months where we talk about different things in relation to Gnosis Retreat Center. And the last salon that we have, we talked about the idea of self um, and Sartre and free will. And Michael mentioned um, Sartre's idea that the self is an experience uh, emerging in situations. Um, and I guess I'm thinking about what's going to happen once this project is launched and we're in community and we're living in this house together, um, how you understand that at a more systems level, like what what you perceive uh, to happen in terms of healing, how that, how that goes down. Well, uh, uh, here I'm, I'm really at the edge of my thinking, you know, and, and I can't give you an explanation or anything like that. But it seems, as I said before, that uh, community is the main healing ingredient. And, and why this is so, this would actually be a great thing to explore once we have salons, once we have the house and, and, and meet, to explore what actually is the, the healing, what's the role of community, and why is community therapeutic? Yeah, yeah hopefully maybe, I can remain maybe, an ongoing Michael, discussion. Michael, you know that already maybe. And, uh, I mean, you guys have uh, so much experience with that. Well, I just quickly say, yeah. in these other sanctuaries uh, that I've been involved in, and even in individual meetings with people in extreme states, there's there's a there's an experience there, some some kind of essence. Again, it's kind of intangible, but I think it has to do with that 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 Lang said was a prerequisite for this discussion had to do with a change of heart. Yeah. That when we're with someone and and our, we're feeling ourself open and compassionate and empathic. Uh, a lot of the research I think is showing that, that that itself is kind of the necessary and sufficient condition. So if you set up a house where that's intentionally happening and people are striving towards goodwill towards each other, I think that enhances that, mm -hmm. that possibility of agape, of love. Yeah. So there's emotional security that is would you say that, that is provided, yeah? Yeah, and nurturance, yeah. Yeah, okay. 
Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, forgive me if I missed something because I wasn't here right at the beginning. I, my question is about the systems view of consciousness, which if I understood correctly is a rather charming sandwich between the Western view and the mystical view where you have the principle of self-organization which has mental properties or mind associated with it, biological structure, and then the, the mind as we experience it that's supervenient on that. Right. And I'm wondering um, if that's correct and also yes. what's your perspective on the nature of the mind at this, that, that's involved in the self-organization is that in the context of the hard problem, for example, does that mind have qualia? Is that a mind that has I know the, uh, the In the systems view of life, at least the way I, I present my synthesis, uh, mind is a property of all life. Mm -hmm. all, all living organisms are engaged in mental activity or are engaged in cognition. And cognition is uh, the, associated with the very process of life. So with or without a nervous system, you, the, the self-organizing activity of a living organism is cognitive or mental activity. And uh, I, you know, Gregory Bateson was the first who, who uh, came up with this and, and I knew him quite well in the last two years of his life. He was, he lived at the Esalen Institute and I saw him quite often there. And <laughs> in his book, uh, Mind and Nature, he talks about this, but he never talks about life. He never really associates mind with life. And he, in this book, he put forth some criteria uh, for systems, for mind to occur in systems. And he had a set of criteria. And one day, I sat down with him and asked him, I said, uh, look, your criteria for mind um, sound to me like criteria for life. And he didn't blink. He said right away, you're right. Mind is the essence of being alive. And that's such a beautiful statement, which as far as I know, he never wrote down. But he said it to me, and I wrote it down, so <laughs> <laughs> it's preserved. So consciousness, then, is a complex uh, level of mind that requires a brain and a nervous system and which involves self-awareness, not just awareness, but self-awareness. That's the idea. So the level of mind that's present in all self-organizing systems or in life Right. Does it have awareness? Does it have experience? Yeah, it has. Qualia? Does it, it have uh, No, no, it doesn't have conscious experience, but it has awareness of the environment because it, it's involved in perception, decision-making, all kinds of things. So by conscious, you mean having self-awareness, self yeah. but awareness of, um, of the external Yeah, I mean, every, every plant, every tree has awareness uh, of, of the surroundings, of the environment, but the tree, as far as we know, doesn't say, oh, here I am, a tree, mm -hmm. and I experience my treeness, you know. It's not Does the tree say there's the sun? Does it have the, the subjective experience of um, knowing external objects? Well, in I don't sense, a quali quali qualitative sense. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't quality. think because there's no uh, the nervous system. There's there's no nervous system, mm -hmm. so it's 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 all uh, very simple. Although you know there there are other things that are complex in a tree. Anyway, this would be a long discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hello. Uh, so I'm a psychotherapist myself, and I, I learned about you in, in grad school. We had a class called Paradigms of Consciousness, and it was super inspiring. Thank you so All much. All right. Um, uh, actually, I'm called to kind of ask you a question. Like, so um, I, as I was listening, I, w I was compelled to kind of think about um, just how the idea of like how the, 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 the problem with science is, you know, so it's kind of like, 
empiricism, it sounds a lot like imperialism because it's it's like the um, seems like the Western the kind of stronghold of like dominance over the indigenous people it seems to have like a a say in like what is what is reality and what is not reality. And I'm just wondering, as far as like you know your whole take on. Uh, trying to bridge or the link between those two. Yeah. Do you think it's like a, a racial thing too? Because like, uh, you know, with the suppression of the studies of psychedelics and how there is seem, seemingly like a, a dominance of not just yeah, being it's, West it, or white you know, people. No, it's, it's definitely a cultural thing because, and you know, I and many other people have written about this history of the scientific revolution and and uh, the age of enlightenment of the 18th century and the rise of capitalism and all that all these historical development and then you have uh, indigenous peoples who talk about the world as all my relations and think in terms of patterns and connectedness and context and relationships. And that's much closer to the systems view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with that, in that regard, do you think that, that, that white people in general, as sort of a turning point, as you say, like is that, is that something that white people or Western people need to do is to sort of submit and be more, more respectful towards indigenous people as, to, to make that happen? Because well, like, I, th I think that is, that is happening, you know. Always accepting our president, who is totally somewhere else, you know. But but the rest, the rest of us, you know, are are becoming much more respectful. Yeah. I think. Okay. Thank Thanks. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you for being here. I'm very, Welcome. I'm very honored to be here. Um, I was going to ask you about your definition of consciousness, but that question is yeah. already done. So the other question that I have, uh, it's, um, it takes me very, touches me very profoundly because of my work. I'm a psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. I want to know what, what do you call heart? What, what is heart? Because it's not very well studied in, in scholar <coughs> um, research. What, what is it? What do you think? or feel or of the heart field? Well, I, I don't know. I, I take it uh, largely as a metaphor when we talk about, you know, a heartfelt apology or something like that, or from my whole heart, you know. And, and, uh, but it may be more than that. <laughs> I know that uh, uh, there are uh, there is a, a, a biochemical uh, basis for emotions, and those are those are molecules called peptides. The molecules. Uh, Candice Pert wrote a famous book, Molecules of Emotions. I don't know whether she talks about the heart in the book. She talks about the gut and you know various other parts of the body that are rich in peptides and therefore rich in emotions, like the gut feeling. I, I don't know much about the heart in this connection. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hi, my question goes in a completely different direction, I think. What in science today is really exciting to you as a physicist and with the systems view, a preponderance of incredible amounts of computing power, new paradigms in biology and genetic engineering, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with cellular automata and complexity theory emerging yeah. and all of it. What's, what's, what's exciting now that's going on? Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in a stage in, in my life where I just published two years ago, I published this grand synthesis of my life's work in, in this textbook, The Systems of Life. And I'm teaching it as an online course. And uh, it's a course of 12 lectures that uh, also involve a discussion forum. And every time it's, it's uh, called Capra course for easy remembering. And uh, every time I have between 150 and 200 students from around the world. And I've taught it four times now. And, and that's my most exciting thing now. It's not new scientific knowledge. It's be able to really reach out globally and communicate that knowledge. To me, that's the most exciting. Thanks. <coughs> I 
should mention that the capper course is a really interesting thing that's available at the, the silent auction as well. Oh, yeah, right. Hi. Um, I heard a uh, neuroscientist talk uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I'd be very curious about your opinion. Uh, and, and what it was is that, uh, try to summarize this quickly, uh, the point was is that the brain is a box. It's a black box, and it's impenetrable from the outside. So if, if, if you view yourself inside the skull, it's all black and it's all dark. And the only way it can communicate with the outside world are with these sensors that come in. And like any sensor, like vision and hearing and touch, there's a certain amount of error involved with each sensor. So these perceptions of the outside world are coming in, and then the brain gets them into different lobes and different parts of the brain and integrates them and uh, comes to a conclusion. And if the conclusion uh, is really a hallucination because of all the error, and that if many of the same people have the same hallucination, we call that reality. And that that was the point he made of what reality is. And then he said there's this two kinds of sensors. They're the ones that are coming from the outside and the ones that are coming from the inside. Like, and the most predominant sensor is chemical. Uh, actually, it's oronasal. But there are many of them all over the body, including uh, the same sense of smell as in our kidney and it's in our liver and it's delivering signals up as opposed to out from the outside. And these signals, um, we don't react to unless something goes wrong. The outside world we react to constantly. Uh -huh. So the final thing he said is, well, well, what is consciousness? And he said, because of this whole way this works, consciousness is what we perceive about all this integration as we observe it in others. Because we really have no way of knowing what our own consciousness is. It's just the integration of this hallucination that's taking place. And the only way we can really, our brain can perceive it is when we interact. And everybody we interact with contributes this little bit of how we perceive ourselves, which is what you call consciousness. Well, in your opinion well of that. A, a lot of this makes sense to me. I, wouldn't, I would shy away from hallucination. I would not use the term. Uh, the the so-called Santiago theory of cognition says that there is no independently existing objective world out there. That that we bring forth a world, or Varela said we enact a world, and every animal, every plant, every bacterium does the same. So there is no objectively existing world. But uh, to call it a hallucination, uh, I think is. Uh, a little bit sensational. He was tongue-in-cheek with that word. Yeah, was just, yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah, though. But otherwise, it makes a lot of yeah. sense. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> I wanted to, uh, to go back for a second to the community discussion. Um, because we're looking for an experience of community and the question came up, well, why is that important? And I had an interesting thing to, that I wanted to share and see what you think about it. I was interviewing a Native American woman who was also a psychologist and I asked her if community was important for her healing work. And her response was, yes, but community means a very different thing for me than it does for myself as a, a Westerner. She had an indigenous perspective. She says for her, community was the animal, plant spirits, the uh, mineral spirits, the ancestors, seven generations front yeah. and back. So it opened up this meaning of community um, and but she was able to experience this. And then I thought, well, it's interesting because I, as a Westerner, until I found techniques and methods from the culture, could not experience it, so I had this limited, I was kind of trapped in, in a, uh, a human meaning of community, and I think um, her, she was offering her perspective as a larger, more systems approach. You know, you there's a, a very beautiful document called the Earth Charter, and it's a, a set of ethical principles, 16 ethical principles, and the first one is respect for the community of life. I like this term very much, the community of life. That's what she was talking about, more or less. Yes. Cool. Hey, what's up? Um, kind of a shift, uh, weird question. What are your opinions on category theory? What? 
category theory? I don't know. <laughs> like what? Oh. I don't know category theory. Is that uh, a part of logic? Or? Kinda. Uh, yeah. It's like a reformulation of some yeah, theory. Sorry, I'm about not. In terms of I, and I have heard awkward. it before, and yeah. and uh, now that I think of it, I had uh, a correspondent who was writing me a lot of letters and saying, "You have to study this category theory," yeah. but I never did. <laughs> so yeah, it's worth it. I think you're really sorry. Dig it. Uh, we should chat. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, I, I just one. had an interesting question, I, I think. Um, what, what I'd like to understand is what your view is on the way in which consciousness maybe plays a role in the young slit experiment in terms of when a particle can appear as light or an actual object and where you feel that sort of that self-assembly of a system may contribute when the observer or consciousness plays a part in our perceived version of sort of reality? Yeah, well, <coughs> this is <coughs> an old story, you know, Heisenberg and other physicists, quantum physicists in the 1920s and 30s talked a lot about consciousness and what they meant is exactly what you say. You do an experiment, in this, in this case the famous double slit experiment, and uh, an electron may appear as a particle or it may appear as a wave. The way I often used it in my uh, lectures and seminars is to say, if you ask it a particle question, it will give you a particle answer. If you ask it a wave question, it will give you a wave answer. And it's up to you, the experimenter, to decide which question to ask, what kind of experimental setup to, uh, to, to make to get a result. But all this, although you, they use the word consciousness, tells you nothing about the nature of consciousness. So it's, it's a little bit of a red herring that you don't, you, you won't learn about consciousness from quantum physicists. Mm -hmm. that, okay. That's my conviction because consciousness is a part of life. And th there are lots of quantum physicists who want to explain to you the nature of consciousness, but they leave out life. And, and you know, they're never going to explain it because it's, it's, a, it's a certain type of cognition characteristic of living organisms. And you have to approach it, that's my view, have to approach it from that side. Okay, thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah, that will be the last question. <laughs> um, but, but the good news is that you will have an opportunity to talk to Dr. Kapper on a more personal level um, uh, at the, the book sign-in table. But anyways, I would love to invite you to a round of applause with Dr. Kapper. Thank, Thank you. you so much. That was a wonderful... <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so, um, the good news is, if you had a question, you know, I saw a, a glimpse of disappointment maybe over there. <laughs> if you had a question, um, Fritjof will be here still, um, mingling for a little while. We, we have until 9 o'clock, in fact, and um, there's going to be a book signing table over here. Where, uh, or just here, yeah, we'll set that up with a few chairs and you can come say hello to Dr. Capra. Um, there's still drinks available at the back. There's no sister retreat center table here. And actually, I'd really encourage you to check out the uh, silent auction where you can uh, potentially win a lunch with Dr. Capra. Um, there are two lunches available, in fact. You can win uh, a love advice with Michael Guy Thompson, who is a, a very a great psychoanalyst. So if you ever wanted to hear it straight from a psychoanalyst or a psychotherapist, that's your chance. And you also have holotropic breathwork, uh, retreat at Esalen, and guitar sessions with Sam Hines, and even a private yoga lesson. So check and that the out. The lunch with me is without any couch. It's just a straight lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Please uh, mingle. There's, uh, we still have some time, and um, there's plenty of snacks and things like that. So uh, say hello to Dr. Capra, and thank you all so much for coming. Um, I'm glad you've all come and, and, and supported. Thank you so much. Thank you.